because I know we all pay for our own broadband supply, but there's, there's gaps. I knew um, you'd come up with difficult questions. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to have to say, I can't answer that one, but um, again, I think there's been an atmosphere of some sort recently on that, but I'm going to go back and find out a bit more about it. I think there's been some sort of commitment yeah. in terms of access to broadband, hasn't there? But in the long term, I wouldn't know how that would affect you here. Well, I think that there's one of the issues we've got, of course, one of the other issues we've got is that our client group is quite elderly. And so trying to persuade our client group to put broadband into their own home, you know, they're asking why they want it, why they need it, but it would obviously enable them to have more services. And as we go through the technological moves that they need the TV to go by. Well, actually, not so much a question about that specifically, although I do know that there's been announcements by the government about broadband availability, and they're trying at the moment to patch the, the gaps, I, I think, think in, yeah, in terms of the supply. Yeah, wasn't it, though, so yeah, I don't yeah. know if Blackboard come in, well, yours is wider, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah, I mean, I am aware that the council was um, looking at some some announcements that were made about the quality of broadband provision in different areas. Yeah. Uh, while I was talking to people on the council about this, I don't know where that's gone now, but um, um, there was a general feeling that we are okay in this area. But the thing is that it isn't necessarily the same. You you may well be quite a long way from an exchange yeah. and a very, very poor quality service. Yeah. That doesn't mean that somebody else in the town hasn't got a very good quality service. Yeah. Yeah. The problem is, how do you differentiate? We're all in the same area. Now, my question was more about the case studies. Um, as Kevin said, there was a, um, a project that we were involved with. It goes back as much as four years. So my simple question was, in terms of case studies, um, these things will have a life in the future, and they may well have more of a life in the future because of the way things are now being organised. But how far back are you happy for case studies to actually delve? Because we, as Kevin said just now, we can go back four or five years and say something innovative was started at that point in time, which will have a big benefit in the future. Now, we want that success story to be the big benefit in the future. You know, right. That will be the success story. I mean, I think it's the here and now that yeah, we that's want fine. to talk about but, mm. but, 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 but you know what's led up to something mm. is is obviously important. But yes. I think yeah that the real interest is what's happening here and now yes. in our country yeah. in terms of you know um, civil society, its broadest sense, mm. um, and what our people do. Because one of the interesting things is that you find these fantastic projects in one place but there's nothing happening somewhere else. And then it's really hard sometimes to work out why something's really successful in one place and not elsewhere. And I think it's been just beginning to tease some of that out. And also, sometimes people say, oh, that's a really good idea. Why don't we try it? And maybe it gives them confidence as well. I think that's one of the things we're finding um, in terms of, for example, community assets and asset transfer. That if people see that somebody has done this work, and look at that success, then you know, th th there are risks obviously attached, but they begin to understand what is required to mm -hmm. achieve something. You've seen the two people stand there. Because I was going to mention that. Is there any other questions, Sheila? Hi, Norman. I'm Dr. Townsend. Let me just ask, I know it's a, it's, it, this is used in as good and bad in different areas, but I'm just wondering about a buy in um, from the civil society into the Portis Review and suggestions for start up working within town centres. Are you linking into that? Is that cross-pollinating? You know, you're coming up with some real <laughs> questions here. I, I mean, I suppose the answer to that is, you know, we would hope so, but I, I would have to go back. There are so many things, but I mean, there were lots of good ideas within that, weren't there, in terms of uh, what's coming Yeah, from the start-up business, and so Yeah, yeah. Do you see lots of opportunities there? Yeah, um, yeah. For both businesses that need developing now. Yeah. I mean, what, what has come, um, what, what, what it, I suppose it seems to be emerging as a real priority is support for social enterprises, you know, and what that support specifically, more specifically should be, and how should we go about offering that, and, and some of it's about um, contract readiness, uh, some of it is about actually the you know, just the detail of, of the start-up and the set-up, isn't it? Because that can be quite hard um, to, to actually get through all the complexities of the administrative side. Um, people might have the vision and you know, the ideas. Um, so, 
that is certainly there. What, what we have got is a bit of a, a, a plan now within Office of Civil Society in terms of our focus on social enterprise. Um, it's in draft form at the moment because I was, I was just checking whether I could share it with you. But it's, it's not surprising in terms of the content of it and the support for social enterprise. Um, what we're trying to do is translate that into the detail and as ever with limited resources. Um, but, but that's not about government doing this, it's about working at a very local level with the organisations and the support organisations that exist already. I mean, you've got some good ones in the North West, I have to say, I think, when I go around the country and talk to my colleagues, um, that there's you know, some really good support networks, but that's not to say that there couldn't be more that government could do to actually encourage mm. that. Well, uh, sorry, just, just to uh, expand on that a little bit, because that is our primary concern. Um, up to now, our own organisation started as a project with government funding. That project ended March, last March, uh, yeah. Yeah, 2011. Now, fortunately, we, we'd operated as a social enterprise, so we, we were able to continue. But there are many support organisations that, uh, by definition, need to be resourced Externally, they can't necessarily operate. We can't charge people mm -hmm. so for the work that we do. I noticed on one of your slides, you did put a resource for social enterprise startup or something of that description. You just mentioned it now. Mm. Is that what is that what we're getting to? Because the organisations like Seller, I mean, don't mind me mentioning this. No, uh, no, the no. organisations like Seller, <clears throat> they don't exist, and the social enterprise sector will diminish. And this is a growth sector, this is something that could actually expand the economic model mm. quite significantly. How Am I right in that assumption from what you just said? I mean, I, I've got to be careful on that. I can't, I can't say things that aren't, that aren't well, we're true. we're only building it. And the, yeah, <laughs> things that, you know, I can stop. Sorry, tell me and I'll stop. No, no, but what I can say, what I was going to say, what I can say practically is that um, when Nick Hurd came to the North West you know, on his last visit, um, he, it was very much to work with Social Enterprise North West because they hosted the event in Liverpool. We then went on and we had a meeting with um, Network for Europe to look at some of the um, funding, Europe, how European funding can be directed towards social enterprise and some of the work that they've done, some of the barriers um, and some of the successes. So in terms of ministerial interest, that is absolutely there. I think it's translated into the practical with a very limited budget at the moment and that's always a challenge. So, you know, there's something about social enterprises themselves making sure they've got a profile that says, you know, we are doing something that's really useful here and I know that you're well aware of that and, and doing your best on that one. Um, and, and ultimately their decisions aren't they about how resources be allocated yeah. but um, I suppose hopeful, uh, why, I, why I talked about the, the support for social enterprise was because I, I, I feel that it is moving up the agenda a bit, oh. so certainly in terms of the area that I'm working in. Take that as a yes then. <laughs> <laughs> I'm being filmed here. <laughs> Did you want to say something? I probably want to say the same as Tony did there. Um, mine was, are we talking legislation or... Checkbooks, basically. Checkbook. Are we talking legislation? So, are we talking local authorities um, right. getting money to get out and legislation to make sure it does? Or are we talking with, to the... Perhaps we didn't want to write better. <laughs> <laughs> Not really. Are we different? Local authorities will divide out money differently. Yes. I'm wondering, is it any legislation? Oh. Or is it I, I don't. I mean, I don't think there's a simple. I don't think there's a simple answer to that because at the moment, I mean, the changes that are happening are very much about localism, aren't they? Right? And, and so, local authorities are giving, like, being given a degree of freedom in terms of how they organise their affairs that perhaps they haven't had in recent years. That doesn't mean to say that this government doesn't have some strong views, and you know, I've given you some policy stuff there. So I think some of it will be followed with interest. And we may have some tensions between what the government is stating as, as stated priorities and what local areas do, and then a debate, a discussion, and decisions have to be made. I can't, I can't see that far into the future. All, all I can say is what the policy, you know, actually is, and, and then what I've given you today is the actual is the national policy. Thank you. Um, Hi, Claire, I'm um, just following on from what I was saying, um, excuse me, I'm just in the process of setting the social enterprise up. And I must say I'm finding it quite difficult 
really to get the necessary information for the, uh, it's a limited company, so I need to get the correct wording in there. But back to the town centres, um, Mary Corsi's review, there are so many active premises now with extortionate business rates and business rentals. Could the government not um, interact with the with local population, perhaps offer free tendencies for a certain length of time to get people started or reduce the cost? Because it would be too far, wouldn't it? It would kickstart new enterprises, but also put presences back on High Street. So it's just you know, you're looking for ideas. I would say your idea back. I'd say in a few notes. Just a general yeah. Yeah. general idea. Yeah. Mm. Okay, thank you for that one. Uh, uh, Colin Johnson from uh, the Grand Theatre. Yeah. Um, there's an idea that's been uh, floating around in our sector, the arts sector, for a while uh, about uh, people wanting to leave legacies to charities. Um, and in the States, there um, is a fund where uh, I can make it a living bequest and charities can draw down on that money from a state fund. And then when the, uh, what's that the right word? When, <laughs> The benefactor dies, that money is claimed back by the state. Yeah. Um, whereas at the moment, we know there are people who have made um, wills and mentioned the Grand Theatre in them, and we're sort of watching the death columns in the Gazette. Um, when actually we need money now, and I'm sure a lot of charities in the same position, is that something that the government would. Um, Again, I'll, 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 I'll take that one back. Um, what I do know is that we're through the giving, the, the team, small team that we have working on giving, um, they've been looking at some of the examples elsewhere because um, people give a bigger proportion um, uh, in, in other countries, you know, so in terms of philanthropy, what we need to understand is why is that the case? Is it because of some of these um, legislative um, things and the rules that people operate within? Um, or it, you know, is there something fundamentally different? But we suspect that we could probably do a lot more about the way in which people give money in this country or are able to give money. May so I like make a suggestion that you put the obstacle, if you like, in, in the yeah. email to Yeah, people just email, that would be good. Yeah. If I can just pick up on the CRP question, um, I've got a colleague uh, who works uh, with schools um, is, is based at the Grand Theatre and she also works with a couple of NHS trusts. She has to have five CRB checks a year. <gasps> three for still, three different still. schools, still. two for an NHS trust. I thought, I mean, you know, our understanding is that they should be, be reducing now, but well, that's still the case, is that right? Okay, that's really useful. Be back to get me. Uh, uh, sorry. Uh, there's a case in our uh, work that's most for uh, one of the pupils school people go into uh, work experience and choose to have their CRP checked. But is it really necessary for 16 years old to have a check? That's one thing we want to ask. So I think these are work experience. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, well that's a very good point. I'm conscious of taking too much of Sheila's time now. Any, we'll take one more question if there is. And if there isn't, which there isn't. I'd like to thank you again, Sheila. Thank you very much for all that. Thank you for coming.